So we're reflecting on the way it is, uh, just to, it's a reminder So time and place and the four foundations of mindfulness so remember, uh, reflecting on time and place, the time is now the place is here. This here and now, Pachubana Dhamma, the way it is, it's like this, and uh, this is a ref- this is using the thinking process as a pointer, not as a definition or a description of anything. The way it is is not describing anything. It's not saying it's you know it's good, bad, right, or wrong. But it's like this. So to me, when I reflect on the way it is, this it's a way of thinking that reminds me of just observing, being the puto, being the, the knower, rather than somebody who's <clears throat> come into the temple at, at, at five in the morning, uh, you know, to do something. The whole uh, sense of oneself as a separate personality, a monk or a nun, lay person, whatever, you know, and then the duties of morning puja and all the rest, it, it, we uh, we tend to be lost in these uh, maybe sense of having to do this, having to conform, retreat. That's how the the um, the word retreat time, community retreat, how that affects. You know, how when you think this is the commun- beginning of the community retreat, it has an effect on consciousness. It's a statement, but then maybe emotionally or personally you have certain sense of, of whatever, you know, of duty or of having to do something, expecting or dreading, whatever, just to be aware of that, of how you emotionally respond even to such neutral suggestions as community retreat. In entering the temple in the building, using the monastery here, Amaravati, for mindfulness. So, you know, we temple was built with uh, this in mind. So at the entrance there's the shoe racks and uh, I've noticed that people don't seem to, sometimes don't seem to use these shoe racks. No, they, it's easy to rush into the temple, slip off your sandals and rush into the temple and uh, without uh, really composing yourself. So, it, you know, this idea of the entrance, the entrance to the temple, whether you come in from the nun's side or the monk's or the main entrance, the same thing too. It's the end is going into something is like this. The sacred place. It's not just a place you go to chit chat or drink coffee. So it, it's a reminder to kind of compose, to bring together this moment here and now. And then how we we uh Developing good behavior in that respect, like opening doors, closing them, uh, taking your sandals, putting them on the shoe rack. This is all part of the practice. It's not just to rush into the temple before five o'clock and, uh, in a fluster, but to really, you know, develop a sense of beauty, of presence, of Respect for even your the sandals or the shoes you wear, the entrance, the coming in and going out. These are very significant uh, events in in our life because our life personally is always a series of going in and going out of things, beginning and ending. 
So whether it's coming in, coming into the temple or going out, it's not to be just, you know, it can be just done out of habit. The mind going out of the temple after this uh, morning puja and, you know, just thinking about breakfast or duties or to really be with the actual movement of your body walking out of the temple, uh, finding your sandals, putting them on, walking out the door. These are quite obvious material signs to use for developing mindfulness, integrating it into uh, daily life. Seeing that Amravati is a mandala rather than is, you know, is just some kind of place that you, you can easily take it for granted and, and everything becomes perfunctory or habitual if we don't use it mindfully and deliberately. So the, say, the monastic life is, a, is the, the, the uh, vinaya, this, this kind of training. It's not, not just to develop habit, m- a vinaya habit, but to develop mindfulness in regards to the the ordinariness of daily life, in regards to eating, sleeping, relationships, duties, responsibilities. So in many, in the West, sometimes people like the Dhamma, but they don't like the Vinaya, because they think, because we, we come from a society that is, that doesn't have much Vinaya anymore. It's about rights and, and uh, proclaiming yourself, asserting yourself, <clears throat> about being free and, and, uh, all the rest. The, the idealism of the time is about freedom, equality, rights, and uh, and then we don't we don't develop any sense of relating to others other than asserting ourselves or demanding uh, certain things from you, demanding respect or equality or uh, whatever you know. We see each other always as equals and as uh, with rights, then we, it, it reinforces this uh, Sakaya Ditti. <clears throat> so in the monastic life, it's a Samana life. So it's, uh, it's about uh, relinquishing. And then this, this investigation of Sakaya Ditti. So not, it's not to suppress this, or it's not a judgment against right or equality or anything like that, but it's, it's putting it in a context where we can see what we're doing. The suffering we create about asserting ourselves independently, demanding rights and respect and, and um, seeing ourselves always in this terms of me and mine, what I think, my opinion, my view, what I like, my sensitivity, my feelings become the way we we expect the world to be sensitive and uh, to to my feelings now that's taking it to absurdity like I've watched this in myself the scene how live at the head of a monastic community <clears throat> you know on a personal level I I could I could used to see this thing in myself that wanted you all to obey me and and respect me, um, uh, and even though it was never that conscious, but uh, you know there's a kind of tendency, uh, sakya ditti tendency to to want to when you're in a vulnerable position like this, being head of a community where you you have power, people you know the community gives me power over them. And then there's projections about whether I'm a good monk or not, or 
fair or unfair or old-fashioned or modern or whatever, then there's a, you know, on a personal level, I, I can think, well, I'm trying to do my best and teach the Dhamma, Vinaya, following the, the tradition, <clears throat> and then people just uh, see me, uh, criticize me, and, and they, but they should respect me and treat me properly. Or watching that, observing that, listening to it, a kind of unstated demand about the world and, how, and my relationship to it is I, my sakyadidi, the sense of my separate identity, me as a person, wants the world around me to do what I want, to, to make me feel secure, make me happy. So in um, training as a summoner, then the summoner is not another perception to identify with, creating the I'm a summoner and you're not kind of identity. is the kind of not getting the point at all, but uh, the summoner is one who's living the holy life. It's about relinquishing. It's not about attaining or achieving. So, you know, what we're doing here at Amravati is almost the total opposite of what the society is engaged in. The, the society we live in is all about attaining and achieving. About trying to, to right all the wrongs, make everything fair, uh, be politically correct. Uh, it's about rights and freedom and and so forth that that uh, self-assertion <clears throat> everybody is the same everybody is as good as everybody else and yet even though we those ideals are you know they're they're perfect ideas actually but in terms of the reality of this moment it's like this and so the samana then is using mindfulness, the puto, observing dhamma, reality. Reality isn't about ideals, but about the way it is. And so this is, the dhamma is, is, is uh, ultimate reality, here and now. It's not about, it's not an abstract kind of possible reality that you can imagine or define or speculate about. <laughs> so during this retreat, awakening to the real, awakening to Dhamma, is just this point of intersection, this, this gate to the deathless, this, this uh, seemingly fleeting, faint, recognition of the here and now, which at first, you know, might be just, you're trying to figure it out, think about it. Okay, here and now, what am I supposed to look at? What am I supposed to, and then it's full of, what am I, am I being mindful or not? Then we get caught in the, in the uh, thinking process, in the doubting, in the self-view. <clears throat> So also see this uh, Ramravati as a as a play, you know, as a physical place, physical location in Hertfordshire, in England. So, it, you know, these are the conventions that we we use for naming the locality and so forth. But it's also, you know, supported by the generosity of the lay people. And of course, the lay people have various views about monasticism and tradition. Tradition is, is not something that is highly regarded at this time. It's about, you know, m our progress and, and development, trying to make everything better. 
So we do get criticisms about being old-fashioned tradition, and uh, because uh, you know this is a, it is in very it's probably the oldest uh, existing Buddhist tradition there is. Theravada Buddhism. But when the Buddha, before he <coughs> passed away, you know, there was, uh, with a, Ananda was saying, what are we going to do without the teacher? Who will be our guide? And he said, I leave you Dhamma Vinaya. So this is, this is very, I found this very important. He didn't say Dhamma, just Dhamma. He said Dhamma and Vinaya. So this Vinaya is something too. Uh, really, it's a convention, it's form. It's a, you know, but it is something to really develop. I mean, it's, we surrender to it. We give ourselves to that. The whole point of being a, a samana is, is we are given the right, given the opportunity to use this vinaya. Like lay people can just use the Vinaya, uh, you know, as they choose, but they don't. They've not been given that that through the Sangha. The Sangha gives this like an imprimatur, a kind of uh, encouragement to use Vinaya for mindfulness, not for identity. So uh, the Vinaya isn't to increase Sakaya Ditti about Baramasa or anything like that. It's it's an expedient means. A tra- it's a tradition that has managed to survive through uh, time, two thousand five hundred fifty-two years. So it's 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 not something to you know th- that suddenly we have to change the vinaya <coughs> because it is old-fashioned. The thing is, we, we learn how to use it. So it's a way of encouraging mindfulness and seeing the, the first three fetters. Because we can make Vina into Silabhata Baramasa or into Sakaya Ditti and endlessly have Vichikita or doubt about our purity or goodness or lack of it or whatever by <coughs> uh, uh, attaching to the convention out of ignorance and, and identity with it. Or when, when you're given the Bapacha and Upasampada ordinations, that's a, you're giving, you're, you're actually being given the, the permission by the Sangha to use Vinaya, not for personal identity, but for as a skillful tool to see the the suffering we create through sakya ditti through the personality view attachment blind attachment to conventions and the thinking process so in uh, bapa cha upasambhada this is a these this is a, like a, being part, uh, continuing in a traditional form, dating back to the Buddha. And the traditional encouragement and, and uh, recognition of Sangha, giving the right for individuals who ask for ordination to use this form. So in one way, it's giving up personal freedom, isn't it? Becoming a summonized, we're giving up our rights. And uh, personal freedom. Because I have a, you know, as a, as a citizen of this country, I have a right to have money. And for sexual activities, it's one of human nature's greatest pleasures. I have a right to for sexual activity and having money, owning property, 
asserting myself as an individual, voting, taking part in politics, part of my duties as a citizen, and so forth, to to uh, see it in terms of cultural identity and rights. But in taking the ordination, then it's it's giving up rights. Voluntarily, it can't be forced. If it's, if you're forced to do it, then it's tyranny. But this has to be done with, with an open heart, you know, going into it, eyes wide open. So, you're not kind of encouraged to, to see it as something to reinforce your views and opinions and the sense of yourself and your cultural uh, opinions about how things should be, but it's it's a standard, it's a boundary, it's a tradition that we use for reflecting on our own sense of insecurity, personality, conventional habits, cultural attitudes, social identities. If we don't have any vineyard, then it's much more difficult because it, uh, you know, it's, you know, it personally, we, some people are quite, you know, can function quite well <coughs> and have, seem to have, uh, ability to reflect. But in terms of community, establishing Sangha is community. It's all about, not about individuality, it's about Supatipano Ujupatipano, so it's communal. Then uh, the agreements are around the Vinaya, of how behavior, relationships through the Vinaya, agreements about action and speech, about uh, living in a way that it, we, you know, we're not intentionally irritating or or uh, exploiting each other etiquette learning how to you know because we come from different backgrounds or cultural backgrounds different levels of social identity so it's an agreed form of of moral commitment of etiquette that is part of a tradition. So this tradition of course is is um, you know is Theravada we call it Theravada Buddhism so we, we have this connection to Thailand, to Sri Lanka Burma Laos, Cambodia because these all are very what we, we uh, assume are Theravadan tradition. So mindfully, we're not we're not taking sides of Theravada against other forms of Buddhism, but we're we're noticing mindfully. This is the restraint. This is the th- these are the boundaries. Th- this is the quality of this tradition. It's like this, you know. So you get a feeling for it, uh, the sense of of this tradition as something to use rather than than to be caught up in trying to change it or or compare it with Mahayana or other religions. It's it's a boundary, it's a limited convention, it's a it's an ancient tradition. And they and when we we are given that Right of entrance into Sangha in, in the formal procedures of Bapa Chao Pasampada, then that means <coughs> that our, then our, we're, we're having this, we're given this, this right sense of go for it, use this, these forms for liberation. So that's our whole purpose in, in this life as a samana is liberation from ignorance. So it's not about spreading Theravada Buddhism or converting people to Buddhism or, or to, you know, to 
to make Buddhism better than it, than it is, than we think it is. Because I've seen this a lot in the, in the Western world, you know, about trying to improve Buddhism, make it modern, make it European or British or American. And I don't trust that kind of thinking, you know, I can see where it comes from. Uh, because, uh, uh, like, uh, culturally there's a kind of conceit in the West, Western world, that I've seen in myself. A conceit that, that somehow we're modern and we're, we're progressive and we're somehow superior to uh, traditional forms. So we can look at uh, India or Thailand or Asian countries that are very traditional and, and we think they're still back in the dark ages and we're modern progressive with all our ideals. It's not to dismiss these ideals because ideals are perfect. You can, you can create perfect ideas. But, um, and, and that idealism itself, if not understood, can be, uh, and grasped out of Sakya Ditti leads to suffering. Because we can't make this changing, conditioned, sense, sensitive state we're in into an ideal. It's, it's not an ideal. The human body is not an ideal. It is like this. It, it gets old, gets sick, pain. It, you know, we, we have to deal with the changing conditions, not with uh, the best of being human or the best human body. Maybe sometimes when we're young we can maybe make ourselves into perfect uh, physical specimen, but to sustain that over the years is impossible. So that our encouragement is this awareness, mindfulness. And during this retreat, really uh, determine, it's, it's a kind of almost stubborn determination to, to use this form for watching, for observe doubt and insecurity and resentment and uh, fear and all the rest that come in, or having to conform. Or being critical of this tradition or Vinaya or whatever. It's just, a, you know, the tendency to love it and hate it and it changes. You know, love, hate. Um, sometimes we like it, sometimes we can't stand it, but the awareness of that. Loving, liking, being gung-ho about Theravada Buddhism or detesting it is like this. These are changing conditions. So we're not asking you to, to carry the flag in a, in a gung-ho way, you know, to, and to, that you have to believe we're the best and we're the crack team and, and we're the only way to do it. And if, if you tend towards that kind of uh, thinking, be the observer of it, not the owner of such tendencies. Also, during this time, you know, to, to lock up your cell phones and laptops and the computer room in the monk's vihara. Uh, don't use it, don't go near it, so that you can. Uh, you know, you're not, it's so easy to distract oneself with these kind of uh, incredible uh, machines that we have now. And there's always kind of justification for going on the internet or checking your emails and uh, it's so convenient now, it's amazing. Uh, just to, you know, email now makes us, you know, want immediate responses. 
And so the, the, it increases this sense of, you know, of wanting some, you know, wanting to hear from somebody immediately, get a direct answer, you know, send an email and they should answer back. Sometimes people send me emails and I don't bother to answer them or I, and they get very upset with me. Or I don't answer the telephone because I don't feel that I have to. You know, that I'm a kind of slave to, to people's, uh, correspondence or when they phone me or email me, you know, this is, uh, and yet I can, I, you know, I can feel, you know, I want, if I send an email, I want immediate response. But observing that of, you know, how convenient it all is and how quick it used to take ages when you had to go through the postal system. But during this retreat, really, uh, you know, put away these machines and and determine to to just watch. You know, if you're going to watch anything, you know, watch the melodramas going on within your mind. The love-hate, the poor me, uh, what I like, and, and... what I want and what I don't want and the resentments, the jealousies, the fears, all of it. Be the, be the watcher of the melodramas. Not the critic. It's not to criticize any of the melodramas and about should or shouldn't, but it's this, this uh, mindful place of awareness which is not judgmental. It's not saying <clears throat> it's not saying it's right or wrong, good or bad, but it is like this. This impulse to to use the computer or the cell phone is like this. To see that, to get aw- become aware of that, the way we we have that impulse to do it. It's like this. And in this retreat time, this is a special time for not to following that impulse. But you still, you know, because these things easily become habits, we become addicted to these machines, then it's easy to just, you know, follow the impulses. So I encourage you to to really observe that, that, that first movement of, of wanting, you know, wanting something or impulse to do something is like this. And then the mindfulness is, then it's not judging it, but just when we make a determination, then uh, it's like aditana, to just make it very clear, very conscious that this is not, you know, we're trying to see this in terms of Dhamma rather than in terms of personal uh, preference or habits or judgments about right and wrong, good and bad, should or shouldn't. <clears throat> so that like when I first went to stay with Ajahn Chah, first year as a bhikkhu, he said, put away all your books. <clears throat> Fortunately, I didn't have many books anyway. <laughs> But uh, it's good advice because I, I'm a, I, I used to be a, a kind of compulsive bookworm. I loved reading and, and I was addicted to reading. And so wherever I went, I had to have a book with me. I feel very insecure, uh, you know, if I didn't have a book to read. And so this is... Uh, and then, um, you know, Lung Po Cha saying, put away your books. And there, there was no uh, cell phone, a telephone. If you wanted to make a telephone call, you had to, it was so much trouble because you had to go into the town of Warin to do it, which was a lot of bother, you know, because he, he wouldn't even allow cars in the monastery, like to, to the monastery to own a, a vehicle, like a car or a van. And lay people were trying to give him vans and 
insight, things like that, and he wouldn't accept them. So we learn to just observe. That, and if it's an emergency, then of course things were adapted to an emergency situation. Uh, so it wasn't just cold-blooded refusal, but it was, you know, at that time there was not the technology or the convenience that we have uh, at this monastery in terms of, of technology, of vehicles, of laptops, of cell phones. So this can be, uh, you know, an obstruction and, and a, a for us in our cultivation of the holy life. So you, you really want to make it very clear what the point of this life is. You know, what, what are you here for? And to make it fully conscious. Like, like what I encourage you to do is, uh, when you start thinking about, am I really here for liberation? Or am I real? Then you're caught in the Sakya Ditti problem again. Or you can, you know, when you start thinking about your intentions for being a Samana, you can get very confused because it can be based on a lot of ideas or ideals that you have. So, w what I have always done, like in the uh, ordination ceremonies, it's uh, the whole point of this is to realize the deathless, to be free from delusion. Be liberated. Enlightened, whatever words, you know, you particularly like or find useful. <clears throat> Here, you know, this is, and whether, you know, you, you know, just make this very rational, coming from, not from an inspired mind, you know, I love the Dhamma so much, I'm going to dedicate my life towards liberation. Those moments when we make aditanas or determinations from, from an inspired mind, sometimes we, we can't do it, you know, we, we, we need inspiration to feel that way. So, you know, I've seen it in myself, when I get inspired then I want to give my life to the Sangha and so forth and uh, get, get high on the, all the, the kind of inspiration and that is so enjoyable when you are having those inspired moments, but they don't last, you can't sustain inspiration. And so, <clears throat> it's from a cool, kind of cool intellectual position, rational. So no matter how many doubts you might have about your intentions or your, your abilities, uh, you know, as a person to, to be liberated from delusion, that's not the point. To make it very clear, I'm here, this is using this form, this tradition for liberation. Complete freedom, complete liberation from delusion. And then whether, you know, how you, you see yourself as capable or incapable uh, is not the point. That's why it, it's better to make this aditana from a cool place, from a very rational, using your rationality, not your emotion. So then to, to make that very firm, you know, affirm it so that it, it kind of sticks in your mind. It, it's not just the passing, fluttering movement of, uh, you know, in, in an inspired moment, but it's quite deliberately constructed and, uh, and determined the goal of the holy life. the unshakable deliverance of the heart. This is the purpose, this is the goal of, the, of this life. <clears throat> and and doesn't have any, don't, don't believe anything about whether you're capable or not. You know, may, I, I encourage you to make this determination in a very rational way. And to, and to really respect this. This is the best. You know, I can't think of a, a more perfect 
goal or determination to make as a human being than this. It's, it's an ideal and it's perfect. It's idealism at its very best. To become king of the world or emperor of the universe, uh, that pales into madness. As uh, you see, the, to be free from delusion. Within, and yet having to live within the restriction and confinement of a human body on a planet like this. Being in a totally sensitive state, continuously sensitive environment. This is all about feeling and pleasure, pain and beauty and ugliness and day and night and all the rest. So we're in this very fraught state of changing phenomena, that relentlessly moving from one thing, from birth to death, from beginning to ending. And yet this determination, it can be just another thought in the mind, but I'm not asking you to, to make it uh, as some kind of personal identity, but from a, a, this rash, cool, rational place, that we all can use, how to use it, to affirm it, to respect it. And then from there, you know, you have this, that's your, that's why you're here, in other words. That's why you're willing to, to live this life, to, to be a samana. And so then we look at each other, we all make this same determination so, in that way, we're all equal. Our determination is exactly the same, the goal of the holy life. And that way, you know, is worth, that is worthy of respect. That is beautiful, inspiring, worthy, worthy of offerings, worthy of gifts, worthy of respect. And then, then we have our own karma to deal with, the way we are as a person, uh, how we react to the conventions, to the position, to the structures, to the tradition, and all of that. Our own personal needs, emotional needs, you know, and and habits and tendencies, addictions, fears, and desires are going to, you know, as part of the is the developing the path, not through through suppression or denial or rejection, but through awareness. So this is like the unshakable deliverance, agupa jado vimuti in Pali. Unshakable deliverance of the heart is through cultivating awareness. First, we have to recognize it. Not define it. You can't define it. You can't find it as an object. You have, it's, a, it's an imminent state. It's just being awake, recognizing. You can recognize when there's awareness. Rec- awareness is like this. You say, well, exactly what do you mean, Ajahn Sumedha? When they try to explain it to you, you get more confused. So, <clears throat> not about defining it because it's it's not about it isn't a quality uh, that is that can be it, it's not a quality at all but it's a natural st- a state of being aware it's innate in this moment it's imminent it's here and now and it's rec- then it's recognized And from there, once you you begin to, you know, don't try, when you think about it or doubt it, then come from where you're at. If you you don't understand what I'm saying and you're getting confused, then bring attention to whatever you're feeling, to the reaction that you might have to what I'm saying. It's like this. If what I'm saying is confusing you, you know, you think, oh, 
Ajahn Sumedho's morning reflections, God Almighty, you know, it totally confused me. Then be aware of that. You know, this is a matter of not, not trying to, to uh, figure out what I'm saying. Or to think you can understand it from the Sakya Ditti level, but it's an, it's an encouragement or an invitation to awaken. Listening. Like at this moment, here and now, sitting here in this way, there's the body sitting like this. So that's something that's here and now, isn't it? It's not, I think, in my body, then I'm making it more than what it is. You know, I'm Ajahn Sumaita, and I'm sitting here on this high seat. And then it becomes personal and, or conventional or whatever. But in awareness here and now, it's just recognizing the, the sitting postures like this. It's using the, the movement of the body, sitting, standing, walking, lying down, the four postures, as, as a help, as an aid towards awareness. Not, not for Sakya Ditti, which then it's about do I sit well or not, or whatever, then it's about how well I sit or don't sit. Or can you sit on a chair and become enlightened, or do you have to sit on the floor? Or do full lotus, you know, some various opinions can float around about you have to have perfect posture to become enlightened. So then people sitting on chairs start, well, I, you know, I, I can't ever attain full lotus, so I just have to put up with a kind of second class enlightenment, chair sitters. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I mean, but this is the Sakyaditi again, isn't it? It's about, you know, me and, and I can't sit on the floor. Sitting on a chair is not, you know, is uh, not as good as sitting on the floor, but I can't sit on the floor. So maybe I'll have some kind of third-rate enlightenment experience. That, I don't know if you go into that kind of absurdity, but whatever it is, it's, it's being aware of the posture, whatever you're sitting on, is like this, the way it is. Standing, walking, lying down, there in the, this, this retreat time, you use the, these four postures for reminding. Wherever you are, you're either sitting, standing, walking, or lying down. Breathing. Wherever you are, you know, you're breathing, whether you're sitting here in the temple or in your rooms, in the sala or office, you're breathing in and out. So this, this helps to, to focus on what's happening now. That isn't, isn't, isn't about, doesn't trigger off your sense of yourself as a person. So the, these are the kind of foundations, beginning foundations of using the body, noticing, the, just having a body is like this. The pressure of sitting is like this. It's, it's observing, the observing the body, not being some, not identifying with the body as you sit well or don't sit so well. applies to sitting, to standing, walking, and lying down. Because these are the four common, ordinary movements of the human body through the day and night. So it's, it's always, you know, always a focus on the, on the posture is, will help. The body is a, is a great help because it is heavy condition. It's obvious. Nothing subtle about it. And then, um, then the breathing little more refined than just the posture. I remember when I first started meditation at Wat Mahatat, I found 
Anapanasat, the most frustrating thing, just to be aware of, first I couldn't even find my breath. Like a zephyr breeze at the end, at the tip of your nose. So I used to sit there and try to, and it was so obvious, but yet when I, when I, when they gave the description about zephyr breeze, at the very tip of the nose, I, I kept, those words kept getting in the way, trying to think it was more than just this, breathing in, breathing out. The four foundations of mindfulness uh, you know, uh, this is dealing with the first one is Gayanu Patsana Sadipatana is, is the body, be a body awareness, Vedana, aware of, of uh, feeling, pleasure, pain, and neutral sensation, feeling. And recognize that this, uh, this is a feeling experience from birth to death. You're, we're all in this relentless state of sensitivity. <clears throat> <clears throat> from the day you're born to the day you die. This is, this is what sensitivity is about. Senses, sense realm is like this. The human body is sensitive. The, this planet is sensitive. It's all about sensitivity and senses and feeling, pleasure, pain, neutral sensation. These are the categories of of, of uh, that we use pleasure, pain, neutral. But the main point in Vedananu Pasana Satipatthana, the second foundation of mindfulness, is to use feeling. We can be aware of pleasure, pain, and neutral sensation or feeling through the senses, through seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching through mental uh, conditions. We can feel happy or sad according to what the way we're thinking. Inspired or depressed according to uh, attachment to, to p- ideas or thoughts, feelings. So Vedana then is, is to be seen not as some kind of personal problem, but it's just the way it is. We're all stuck in this sensitive state, in a, in a, you know, in a, incarcerated for a lifetime in the, in, in your own body. You know, so it's, uh, this is just the way it is. And then the, then the practice is, switching on the floodlight to see it, to observe. Because if we are just sensitive creatures uh, with no ability to observe, to witness sensitivity, then, of course, it is. We just have to bear with it, you know, kind of resign ourselves or get into drug addiction or something or depends on, you know, personal tendencies. But... We don't get into drug addiction or anything like that, but to refrain from that so that we can observe sensitivity, feelings of despair or elation or pleasure or pain, neutral sensation. And so that's mindfulness again. Mindfulness the point of intersection between timeless and time, gate to the deathless, where you have perspective. You're at that point of intersection where you're having to to experience time-bound conditions continuously. The human body, the emotional habits, the thinking, the seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, all of that is time-bound is condition. It's relentless, going from birth to death, beginning to ending. 
ongoing rebirth through these conditions that we that we have as our karma, the human form that we are experiencing now is like this. The sensitivity is like this. And then the jitanupasana, the state of mind, the mood, the feeling, is like this. And then tamanupasana, the fourth foundation of mind, seeing, seeing this in terms of dhamma rather than in terms of cultural ideals or, or, you know, attitudes that we acquire through conditioning, but seeing it in terms of, of Dhamma teaching, of the unconditioned, the condition, seeing the, the Four Noble Truths, the dependent origination. So we're seeing Dhamma, knowing Dhamma, then that's Buddha knowing Dhamma. That's not Ajahn Sumedha knows Dhamma anymore. And it's not Ajahn Sumedho is Buddha. It's, I take, you know, in a convention where I take refuge in awareness. To me, that's Bhutto. It's not, it's not Sakyaditi. It's this pure awareness that is at this point of intersection between the timeless and time and where we can rest. Once we recognize it, then that is liberation. But if you don't recognize it, then you're always, you know, f- floundering around with the conditions, trying to, f- you know, figure out what you're supposed to do or who you are or how you're feeling and getting <coughs> caught in that, in that whirlpool of conditioned phenomena. And in the monastic life, you know, because this is a quite a busy monastery and well known and so forth. But always keep this practice as your precedent. This is what you're here for. Don't let all the intimidations, responsibilities, uh, uh, and the rest kind of take you over and, and, uh, bind you to, to the world. This is very important, you know, to be able to, this is the priority, this is what you're here for, your determination for liberation. But then the world can impinge, it's very intimidating and about how you should and you've got to and must and this person needs and, and, uh, you know, all kinds of, and we're, you know, most of us want to help people and, and be a benefit to others. And so it easily goes back into Sakya Ditti. You know, that's why it, it's important to, to awake and to recognize this and cultivate it. And then, then we can do the best we can with the conditions we find ourselves in. With the bodies we have, with the places we're in, with the people, with the uh, people we're living with in the society that we're living in. So, you know, like, uh, uh, a nun's going to California. This is important to make this your priority because the uh, Starting a monastery in a new place is very, you know, that people all ki- expect all kinds of things. And, and then good people always want to, you know, help. And one can just get overwhelmed with good intention and uh, forget this important intention for the holy life. And that's the, the best offering you can give to the world, to the society. You know, what is the best thing right now that I can, as Ajahn Sumedho, do for the world that I'm living in, for the whole planet, for all sentient beings? 
you know, so I contemplated this. Well, at this very moment, what is it possible that I can do for the benefit of all sentient beings at this very moment, not about the future, at this moment? And the, and the only answer is mindfulness. Doesn't seem like much in terms of quality, is it? In terms of, it doesn't seem like anything at all for most people. But a human being that is mindful, this is something, this is a gift. This is a supatipano. This is a ujju patipano. Yaya patipano, samiji patipano. This is, this is a blessing. Not me as a person. It's not, I'm a, I'm a great blessing to the world as a person because that's not it. That would be Sakya Ditti. That would be uh, ego again. But, uh, you know, contemplate at this moment, timeless point of intersection between the timeless and time. It's not about me spreading Buddhism all over the planet. But it's at this very moment, if, if there's only the ultimate reality, paramatta satya, that's, the, that's real, that's true. And that, and that the Buddha said, through mindfulness, we recognize it, enlightened. What is that? And that is awareness. It could only be mindfulness, sati sampatanya, sati panya, here and now. And when you think about it, it doesn't seem like very much. <laughs> Don't think about it. You, you, you know, it's not about thinking or judging anymore. It's just recognizing. And from that reflection, you know, that's your purpose. That is the point. That is the, the ultimate uh, purpose of this convention, of this holy life that we're living, of this monastery. You know, to really recognize it, affirm it, and trust it. You know, determine to trust it no matter what, no matter how your mind goes all over the place full of doubts and fears and whatnot. It's always this, this is so, so important to recognize this and trust it and cultivate it. So then, this is the, this is the path, the samaditi samasangapo, of the Eightfold Path. But before you can do that, you have to recognize it. And recognition is like the Four Noble Truths, is a, is a very skillful tool for recognition. It's pointing all the time at here and now, suffering, its causes, and the relinquishing of the causes, letting go, and the recognizing the cessation of suffering is like this. Samaditi, right understanding, perfect understanding then. It's no longer based on ideas of Buddhism or <coughs> different interpretations of Pali words. It's, it's a gut knowledge, it's known in a direct and real way. So it's not something that that you waver and aren't sure of. When it's just intellectual, then you're, you're always going to waver about, never quite sure whether your interpretation is the right one on a personal level. But if you trust, recognize this, and cultivate it, then it gives you a confidence, not through Sakyaditi, but through Dhamma, through knowing Dhamma in a direct way not through theorizing or thinking or having views about Buddhism or Dhamma. <clears throat>